YouTube, this is Darian Cohen. I have found a very reliable and free way to stress test your CPU's overclock to find out if it's stable. And you can run this endlessly, plus it supports multi-threading. If you have more than two cores, just run more instances. It is called Stress Prime 2004 Beta Orthos Edition, and we just like to call it Orthos. I have Orthos in a zip file uploaded to Mediafire, and I will include the link on the video description. Here is the program. It comes with a worker dynamic library file, and it creates two files with the .ini extension. Orthos is a program by Johnny Lee. We have different options. We have small FFTs, large in-place FFTs, and blend. This will either stress your CPU, RAM, or both. But my favorite option is stress CPU with Gromax Core. Gromax Core is what Folding at Home uses, and since it is so reliable and works so well at giving the CPU a hell of a time to process, it's perfect. I'm just going to go ahead and start this. Okay, the priority is at once. I mean, the priority is at one, so you know. It's basically running as idle. As idle as the system idle process. So, you know, that really never affected you when you were using your computer. This doesn't really either if you're running it at one priority. Each iteration is 12 and a quarter megaflops, or 12,250,000 floating point operations a second. Orthos will complete a thousand iterations on every core, and if there are any errors, you will be notified immediately. This is the only way to know how fast your computer really is. This is the only way to be certain how fast your processor is in real-world tasks. Because what synthetic benchmarks are comprised of are much too simplistic for even the computer illiterate. This is the way to test your CPU out in the field and actually test it. And this is an actual test. Hertz, cache, and all that other crap don't matter because speed varies across all the architectures. But now you can directly compare between completely different architectures. This is also the quickest benchmark for being the most reliable. Run it for a minute, and if you really want to torture test the CPU to make sure it won't overheat or being unstable corrupt data even during simple file transfer operations, though this is more likely due to RAM, you should run it for about an hour or two, maybe an entire day. I don't know. It's up to you. If you can't leave your computer, then just do 10 minutes. Every 5 seconds, my Pentium 4 at 4 GHz with hyper threading scores 25 gigaflops. Every second on my 8600 GT at standard clocks, it scores 70 gigaflops. 70 billion floating point operations per second. And overclocked as far as it will go, given 5 seconds, could do 520 gigaflops, or half a teraflop. There's a huge difference. There is just no comparison here. That is the thing. GPUs are faster than CPUs, but they are for parallel tasks, doing several things literally at once, whereas a CPU doesn't multitask, it only computes in sequential order. And you cannot render graphics like that. It takes several minutes for our modern games to crunch through maybe 100 or 2 frames, and it takes several months to render CGI movies. The only way to achieve parallel tasking is to add more processor cores to the CPU. That is how they used to render movies entirely composed of computer-generated imagery. Back when they used to use entire Pentium 3, Pentium 4, and Athlon farms to render a movie like Final Fantasy The Spirits Within, it must have took them forever. Usually when they render a CGI movie, they do it at some insanely large resolution that may exceed the HD standard by at least three or four times, and that was just in 2001. The program remains in your taskbar, and it also includes sensor readings, but I don't know if it really shows those readings. I never went through 80,000 iterations of small FFTs yet, but you could try it and tell me how it is. It seems it takes too long for one CPU with two logical cores, which would be my hyper-threading enabled Pentium 4 in this case. Priority from 1 to 9, but don't choose 10 because that will make it real-time, and thus devote every available CPU cycle to it completely throttling all your other tasks. Even the mouse cursor will skip about every second or so. Well, viewers, download and run this program and see how it goes. Uh, see how it does. My record is 320 gig flops a minute at 4.3 gigahertz with hyper threading. Whatever you get is going to be pretty good. 
okay, because a Pentium 4 is half the speed of one core of a Core 2 Duo in perspective. So say if you have a 2.6 GHz Core 2 Duo, single core applications like games will run equivalent to the speed of a 5.2 GHz Pentium 4. Hyperthreading adds a 5 to 50 percent boost to 5 to 50 percent boost to multi-threaded tasks because at 4.25 gigahertz without hyperthreading, I'm only getting 250 gigaflops a minute. 70 gigaflops short of scaling upward, 50 megahertz and enabling hyperthreading. Even a Pentium 2 at 2 gigahertz is 80 percent as fast as a Pentium 4 at 4 gigahertz. So you see, the only things Pentium 4 are lacking in are the core speed and cache. Intel improved by going the opposite direction. Instead of making higher frequency single cores that overheat past 3.8 GHz, like the Pentium 4 with hyperthreading that was 3.6, 3.8 GHz, they added more cache, balanced frequency to a moderate 2 to 3.6 GHz in most cases, and paired up these cores to achieve more at once in half the amount of time to less than a quarter while only producing half the amount of heat and using roughly about half 50 percent less voltage uh yes the pentium 4 runs as warm as two core two duos in one no mine does not overheat ever i have a spectacular rocket fish universal cpu cooler i bought for 30 bucks add some air conditioning and i drop my temps down to 34 fahrenheit system and idle up to 70 to 80 fahrenheit on load that is how I achieve over 1 GHz on the FSB and RAM to reach 4.25 GHz on the CPU with hyperthreading. Anyways, that is all for now. Farewell viewers, I shall make more tutorials later.